My name is Guy Marks. I'm the President of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease. And I'm very pleased to be able to speak to you today on World Tuberculosis Day. The title of my talk is We Must Find TB to End TB. And the subtitle is Back to Basics. And when I say Back to Basics, I'm going back to this guy, Robert Koch, who on this day, in 1882, 141 years ago, reported to the Berlin Physiological Society that he had evidence for what was the cause of tuberculosis. He had shown that the organism that we now know as Mycobacterium tuberculosis was the sole cause of the disease that we know as tuberculosis. Around this time, partly by work that he did and by work that were done, was done largely actually by other German scientists um, in the late 19th century, we had most of the tools that are required, most of the microbiological and x-ray tools that are required and have been used since that time for the diagnosis of TB. After the Second World War, during and after the Second World War, a very active program of chem chemistry and pharmacology, pharmacy, res pharmacology research resulted in the development of a number of key drugs that were very effective for treatment of tuberculosis and remain the mainstay of treatment for tuberculosis 70 years later. So we've, had, we've known what causes TB, we've known how to diagnose it, and we've known how to treat it for a very long time. And in many countries, we've been successful in essentially ending TB as a major public health problem. Here are some examples from Cuba and Japan. And here is from my own country, Australia, where we had a national TB campaign that went from the 1940s until the mid 1970s. And during that campaign, deaths from tuberculosis largely disappeared by the end of that campaign. And this happened in other countries, in, in uh, northern and western Europe and in North America. Um, and yet, despite this success in many countries in the so-called global north, in many other countries, tuberculosis remains a huge problem. And now, in 2021, it's estimated that 10.6 million people became ill with tuberculosis and 1.6 million people died due to tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, other, before COVID, was the biggest infectious disease killer in the world. So it is, despite the successes that I alluded to earlier, it remains a massive problem in the world, and we are not on track to end TB anytime soon at the current trajectory. So what does cause TB? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we've really known this since the time of Robert Koch. Everyone who developed TB has been infected by somebody else with infectious pulmonary TB, infectious lung tuberculosis. You cannot develop TB if you've not been exposed to and infected by a person with TB. It is an infectious disease. These infections may occur in the household, they may occur in the workplace, they may occur in some facility like a hospital or an aged care facility or a prison or a school, or they may occur in the general community setting. Usually in an indoor environment, this is an indoor, this is a airborne in infection and airborne infections are more likely to be transmitted in the indoor environment. In high burden, so we've known that for a very long time. What we have not known for so long, but is now becoming apparent, is that most people who develop TB in high burden settings, that is in countries where TB is very common, where there's a lot of TB, most of those people who are developing TB have been infected or in some cases reinfected 
within the preceding two years. TB infection is a state that can exist for many years, for decades in people, and can reactivate much later, decades later. And in low burden countries, that is a common situation that arises and common cause for people to develop TB. But in countries with a very high burden of tuberculosis, most cases of TB occur in people who've been infected relatively recently. So it follows that the way we, what we need to do to end TB is to find and treat people with infectious TB to prevent them from infecting others and causing those others to develop active TB and themselves infect others. So we need to interrupt or break the chain of transmission. We need to stop the infectious chain of transmission from happening. And the way to do that is to find and wrap effectively treat everybody with infectious TB. And in fact, this is, as I've mentioned before, how TB was ended in many countries where it did end in the post-war era. Um, it was often mass miniature chest X-ray screening, which was implemented on a large scale to find infectious people, many of whom did not know they had infectious TB. They were found and offered treatment and in giving them treatment, they were rendered no longer infectious to other people. And this interrupted the chain of transmission and ended TB. Unfortunately, this intervention, which had been shown to be very effective and had been very effective by the mid 1970s in many developed countries, was deemed not affordable for developing countries. And in around the mid 1970s, WHO and others decided that they were not going to try and implement this intervention in, the develop, in developing countries. My question now would be, was that the right decision? And in fact, can we afford not to do widespread screening for tuberculosis to end TB in countries where it remains a major health problem? We did a proof of concept study in Vietnam Vietnam is a low to middle income country with a very high burden of tuberculosis. And we did this study in Kamau in the south of Vietnam, uh, where there is a lot of TB, a rural, a predominantly rural province. And our intervention was fairly simple. We first of all engaged with the local community, speaking to leaders and, and, and others within the population. We then went from house to house to explain the nature of the what we were doing, to get their permission to collect specimens from them. And then we collected sputum specimens from everybody um, who we saw and um, then sent those sputum specimens to the laboratory to test with a molecular test to diagnose TB. Those who were diagnosed with TB as a result of this test were then referred to the National TB Program where they were commenced on treatment for TB. This is some photos of some of our field workers in, in Kamau. You can see that the conditions are quite difficult. Here we, you can see a, a, a bamboo bridge, the canals, it's a very uh, it, it's traversed by a lot of water. This is some of the team who were doing that screening a few years ago in, in um, Kamau. The screening, the program which we went, which went on for four years, annual screening for four years, was very effective in finding and treating people with TB. And what this slide shows is that over each year of the study, with each successive year, the number of people who we found with TB fell on average by about 33% per year. So that over the four years of the study, it fell from baseline by 72%. In the final year, we screened a control group, another group of people who had not been screened annually in the preceding four years. Their, their prevalence at baseline was a bit lower, 
And so the difference between the control group and the, and the group that had been subject to annual screening for four years was 44%. So whichever way you look at it, a very substantial decline in the number of people in the population who have TB. We would have liked to have gone on for longer to have driven it down even further, but we had to end the study at this point. We didn't do anything with children in this study. This study, we just screened adults, people aged 15 and over for TB. But after the study was completed, we compared the number of children who were infected with TB. We did a blood test to measure the pre presence of TB infection. And what we were able to show is that in the villages where we had done the screening for and case finding and treatment of, to find and reduce the prevalence of TB, the number of children who were infected was 50% lower than in the control villages, showing that what we had expected to see, that is if you find and treat adults with active infectious TB, you prevent children from being infected with TB. You also prevent adults from being infected with TB. And we also showed in this study that the incidence of TB, that is the number of new cases of TB, declined over the course of the study by 57%. So this decline by 57% shows two things. It shows that this very high incidence at the beginning of the study was largely due to infection that had occurred recently. And when we removed or reduced the risk of being infected, we reduced the subsequent incidence. And it also shows that it is feasible to, in, in this low middle income country, in a remote rural province, to implement an intervention that can have a profound reduction, lead to a profound reduction in the incidence of TB. This is the trajectory that will lead to an end to TB. So what the results mean is that we, they show that we need to and if, uh, find and treat as nearly all people with infectious TB to prevent infection of others and that this will break the chain of transmission. Now many countries around the world are doing some act, active case finding at the moment. But not all of them, most of them have not been successful in reducing the incidence of TB and increasing the, the progress towards ending TB. And I think there are some key lessons from this study which show what needs to be done in implementing active case finding to end endemic transmission and to end TB. One key message which I've already alluded to is that you need to find all or nearly all the cases in a given locality, in the village, in the district, in the province. Many active case finding projects at the moment are focusing on high risk groups or on people who volunteer to come forward for screening. Both high risk groups and volunteers represent a small proportion of the population and therefore only a small proportion of people with TB. And so we need to focus not just on high risk groups and on volunteers, but on everybody in the population. Because every, in these highly endemic populations, in these places with a high burden of TB, everybody is at risk of having TB, not just selected people. We have to test everybody regardless of whether they have symptoms or not. I didn't show these data, but there are data from other studies now, many studies, showing that many patients with infectious forms of tuberculosis do not report symptoms of TB, do not seem to, either do not have symptoms or do not recognize symptoms or do not seek care for symptoms of tuberculosis. So only finding people who have a cough does not seem to be sufficient to find enough patients to NTB. The first screening test 
needs to be something which is sensitive, either chest X-ray or a sputum molecular test, such as the one we just we did in come out. Um, and then having found people with TB, it's obviously es essential that everybody must be um, that everybody who has TB must be linked to appropriate and effective treatment. That is a clear um, requirement for ending TB. And you need to do this, you can't just do it once, you need to sustain it for five to 10 years and repeat it regularly uh, until you reduce the incidence down to a low level. So the key components of active case finding in the high burden settings are creating the community engagement and demand for the intervention, making sure that you find all of the active cases, and then delivering the right treatment safely and effectively to everybody who's found to have TB. And I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues. We, we were invited to visit uh, India recently. This is um, on the right. Uh, Nguyen Tuang and on the left Kang Lu Boy. Uh, this is again Nguyen Tuang and Greg Fox, two of my uh, colleagues working with me in Vietnam. And this is a much larger team of colleagues uh, from Sydney and from Vietnam who've been working on these studies. So thank you very much. Finally, I just wanted to uh, Remind you that we have the uh, World Conference on Lung Health in Paris on the 15th to the 18th of November. We look forward to seeing you there. Submissions for abstracts and symposia and courses are now open and will close on the 6th of April, which is very soon. So please get your uh, uh, submissions in now.